started. I think it's about 11 o'clock. Uh, my name is Russell Duncan. I'm a financial advisor actually out of Wheeling, West Virginia. Uh, we have an office in Wheeling and one up here in Wexford. Um, this is my, my third trip to Pod Camp and my first time uh, presenting. Just give a little bit of information about me. I've, I've been an advisor since 98, uh, so going on 12, 13 years now. Uh, I earned my certified financial planner designation back in 07. Uh, very similar to uh, CPA degree where you have to go through a couple of days examination and so forth on, on various um, areas of financial planning. And typically, first I, I guess I want to thank everyone for coming because I, I don't know about you, but I did this for a living. And I think most people have one of two kind of preconceived notions when they see a topic like this, you know, on a conference schedule, you know, financial planning. And correct me if I'm wrong, how many people here, be honest, are expecting something like this? <laughs> or worse yet, perhaps you're expecting something like this. <laughs> Thank you for not being that guy. So, exactly. I, I, I think that, that today you know, you're going to be somewhat entertained uh, and educated without being hopefully put to sleep uh, as far as that goes. Uh, but but that, is, that has been my experience. But, but I mentioned it, this is my, my third trip here. And coming in the last couple of years, this year's schedule seems pretty similar. Um, I never really thought that I had much to offer in you know, this type of, of conference. You know, it's primarily, if you look at the sessions, most are about blogging or social media, you know, how to get involved with Twitter, all those types of things. It doesn't really seem to be much of a fit for, for what I do. Uh, but sometime this spring, uh, I don't know how many of you know Justin Kanaki. He's one of the, the founders of, of this uh, conference. He wrote a blog post. Uh, and I'm going to just kind of quote from it real quick. It was titled, uh, my, Why I'm Reinventing Myself, A Financial Awakening at 33. And what he said was, and I think it's, it's something that, that's unfortunately not that uncommon, what he said was, last week I encountered the financial equation of doom. A surprise car repair, plus a non-paying client, equal an unexpected budget shortfall. This led to Ann and I maxing out our credit cards, and liquidating all three of our bank accounts just so we can pay the rent. Sucks, right? Those were his words. Um, and it got me thinking that, that a lot of the folks that, that come to PodCamp uh, are in his line of work. They're freelancers in some, some capacity. And I'm curious, how many people here freelance 100% of your full income comes from freelancing? Okay, a couple people. How many people have kind of traditional jobs but you freelance on the side? Okay, most everybody. Uh, anybody considering one day, you know, transitioning from a traditional career to, to freelancing? A couple people. Okay, um, that's helpful because I, I think it'll I'll, it'll shift a little bit of what I talk about today, since since most people are kind of skirting the fence a little bit. But but uh, any questions that you have throughout, just throw your hand up, interrupt me, just just ask as we go. But the more I thought about it, you know, Justin's situation is not that unique. I mean, it's, it's, it's exacerbated because he's a freelancer. If I, I think about myself, I was paid yesterday. I'm going to get paid in two weeks, and four weeks from now I'm going to get paid again. And assuming that I do my job and I, I, you know, fulfill my contract with my employer, I'm going to keep getting paid every two weeks. My wife's a school teacher, she gets paid yesterday, and I'm the first. So it's very easy for us to know and to predict What's going to happen in our lives? I know what I'm going to get paid in two weeks and what she's going to get paid you know, in, in 15 days. It's much easier to, to, to budget, if you will. But if you look at kind of the average family, you know, kind of the traditional American family, the financial picture is, is fairly bleak. You know, income-wise, it's, it's, it's pretty decent on average. Uh, but for the most part, a lot of people have, you know, they're saddled with debt, whether it's housing debt, student loans, credit cards, things like that. And the statistic that I find you know, most amazing is half of the country, if they're married, both spouses, neither of which has any retirement savings whatsoever. And the other half, on average, only has about, this says 35 grand, it's a little bait, it's about $50,000 today. So the whole country, on average, half the country doesn't have plans, the other half has you know, minimal savings. And just recently, there, were, there was an interesting study done, it was a survey that, that appeared in the Wall Street Journal that talked about kind of, you know, more up-to-date look at, at, the, at the average situation, and it, it kind of clarified what happened to Justin, where the survey asked, if you had 30 days, you know, so say the month of October, you had 30 days to come up with $2,000, by any means possible, could you do it? 
any means. You know, it's already saved. You forego some spending this month and you, you save up $2,000. You borrow it on credit cards, you use your home equity, any means possible, friends, family, whatever, could you come up with $2,000? And what percent of the population do you think could do that? Just a guess. Any ideas? 30%? Actually, 25% could definitely, they responded to the survey, could definitely come up with $2,000 in 30 days. How many do you think could not come up with two grand? It's actually half. You know, half the country could not, under any means necessary, come up with two grand. A quarter definitely could, and the other quarter probably could. You know, so what we find is between half and three quarters of the country are kind of in that financially unstable position where you know push came to shove and they had that same situation that Justin did, you know, where they had either a non-paying client if you're a full-time freelancer or a big enough emergency where you didn't have savings, you would find yourself in a position of what he called do, you know, where you have, you know, to, to either borrow credit cards or, or going deeper into debt uh, or where, whatever it might be. Now you would think, you know, what I've said so far that, that, that most people struggle with this issue. And if you think about yourselves, so I was an economics major, I had a minor in finance. You would figure that I would, you know, just coming out of college would have a good deal of understanding of this topic, but the reality is I really didn't. You know, from a top level view, from kind of the global world, how money and banking systems work, you know, I got all that. But there's really not much uh, education, whether it's through high schools, colleges, or even your parents that talk about personal finance. And you would think that my industry, given all of this, would be doing something to, to make it easier for you. The reality is, and I'm saying it's a little embarrassing, but my industry does anything but. And my promise to you today is I'm not going to use much jargon, but the, but the three pictures we're up here today are actual things. I'm not making this up. These are actual things that people in my industry follow and pay attention to. I'll give you one example. The so-called hot waitress indicator. What this <laughs> supposedly is, the theory anyway goes, so it's fine if anyone goes out afterwards to Station Square or wherever, if you notice that the, the uh, the service staff, the waiters and the waitresses, over time are getting more and more attractive. That's a bad sign for the economy. The thinking goes that if people that are attractive who should have an easier job maintaining employment are now working in service-related industries, that's a bad sign for, for you and me. Actual thing that people actually follow in my industry. But to get into some specifics, how many people are familiar with the KISS method? There it is. Keep it simple, stupid. Keep it, simple, stupid. it sounds a little generic, but the, but the first piece of advice I want to give you is when it comes to, to managing your money, simple is, is best. The analogy I use a lot of times, last summer, uh, I played a little bit of golf, not a lot. And that, that's actually not me, by the way. Um, I played a little bit of golf, and last summer, every time I would go up to play, every drive that I would hit would slice violently to the right. Every time. So I get in the car, put the club away, go find the ball, take on the next club, and every time I take on an iron, it would hook violently to the left. So if any of you have played before, even if you've never played, you probably have an idea that a shot doing that, same person, the same swing, just different club, next to a possible form. Now given my personality, what I would normally want to do is go online, watch videos, you know, read articles, you know, search how to cure your slice, all those types of things. You know, probably make it more complicated than necessary. In, in reality, I wouldn't know what I was looking for anyway. So for whatever reason, I chose to, to just book a lesson, a half hour lesson with a local pro. And after watching me swing for five minutes, he knew what I was doing wrong, number one. But number two, he said, you know, look, there's a hundred different things, hundred different things you can do with your swing. But if you get them right, you know, you'll drive the ball 300 yards, it's going to go straight. But the reality is that he, he actually said that he's from the, the keep it simple, stupid school, that if you just focus on four, maybe five fundamentals, if you can get those things right and stop worrying about all the rest of the things, you're going to get yourself 90% of the way there. And the reality is, even if I did all 100 things, I'm not going to become a professional golfer anyway. So even if, if I told you everything that I know about personal finance, it's probably not going to get you where you need to be. There are, there are certain things that if you do, you're going to get much farther ahead. Um, one such tool that I like, and I've talked to Chris, who's in the audience today, I, I guess PNC has a similar tool. They do, it's virtual wallet. Virtual wallet. So this is just one tool that I'm familiar with. By no means is this the recommendation. But whether it's mint.com or virtual wallet or something else, 
these are tools that are, that are available today, either free online or through your existing banking relationship, that, that solve the first problem, keeping things simple. What they do is, in this particular case, what it does is, it aggregates all of your various accounts, checking, savings, uh, credit cards, you have student loans, you have a 401k, uh, you put your house value on all those types of things, and it basically tracks it for you in an easy to read format. You know, I have my checking account at one bank, uh, credit card at a different one, the mortgage at a third, uh, our 401k plans with a different company. I mean, I've got all these different relationships, and I get statements every month, I get them every quarter, sometimes they just email them to me, but they're all separate. So what these services do is they aggregate all of that data into one easy to read format so that I can, once you sign up for the service, it basically takes a couple of hours, pulls in all your data, and then gives you these easy to read reports that tell you right, right now where are you. And you can compare yourself to others you know, either locally or nationally, to get a sense of, you know, from a cash flow standpoint, where are you spending your money? You know, you may think that you spent a lot of money on credit card interest or eating out or whatever it may be, but this puts it down, you know, month by month and will show you where's the money going, you know, what are you heading towards? And, and, and probably more importantly, once you do that, it also helps you set goals. I assume that virtual law does something similar. It does, correct. So you can set goals, because it's, it's fine to know where you are, but it, it, it will help you track. I mean, just for example, yesterday I got an email that showed my weekly financial stat. It showed, you know, where I spent the most money. You know, if I was, I have set up certain budgets that I want to spend, you know, X amount of money every month on my daughter, X amount on entertainment, et cetera. And once I get above that, it'll show me that I'm above for the month and I know to, to, to turn it down. The, the second key thing that, that I found you know, that with the successful clients that we have that, that works wonders is what I call muting the noise. You know, it doesn't matter if it's if it's TV, you know, where Glenn Beck is you know, screaming at you through the television that you have to buy gold. If, if you don't own gold in this environment, you're an idiot. Or Susie Orman saying, you know, you should never have a credit card. Or Jim Cramer acting like a clown. Or maybe it's Money Magazines or all these various publications that, you know, every month they have the top mutual funds. You know, the best place to send your kid to college, or what you have to do in 2012 to get ahead. And for those of us, which is probably all of us that are online, uh, I don't, I don't think I talk about it a whole lot. But there's lots of people that you know, either in the industry or out, that are often talking about their situation, and it just subtly influences you into what you're doing and, and thinking. And, and I set this the stage up under you know the, the guise of freelancers. Um, the, the problem with, you know, I don't know if anyone happened to read the Justin post uh, about his situation, but the problem that he suggested that I, I agree with is most of the advice that's out there, including what I tend to, to, to talk about, is geared towards traditional employees. So a lot of things you find, either through me, through online resources, sources, through the top finance blogs, whatever it may be, these kind of quote rules of thumb, oftentimes aren't going to be very helpful to people in your situation. And I would even argue to, to most people, but some, here's some of the, the typical ones. You know, one rule of thumb I hear all the time is you have to have six months worth of uh, savings built up in some sort of emergency account. Another big one is if, if you're renting, you're just flushing your money down the toilet. And especially if you think about freelancers, you know, for the most part, it, a lot of times it doesn't matter where you live. You know, you could have, you could live in Pittsburgh, have clients in, in Texas, and then do business the next day for someone in Minnesota, it doesn't matter that you're here. So you may choose to move, and if you're owning a home, that rule of thumb isn't going to—it's going to go against you essentially. You know, another popular one is you know buy land because they're not making any more of it. A lot of these things are just kind of generic. They might have been based in something originally that was helpful, but for the most part, it, it doesn't necessarily help you. So I've got just a, a real quick video I wanted to show you, just to kind of uh, I think will help tie some of these things together. There's no sound, but it's just music anyway. <coughs> and the, the tagline is something to the effect of, you know, your money can't manage itself, but it, it, it sure will try. And the idea behind what, what the CFP does, what the Certified Financial Planner uh, planners do, is we try to you know help take all these various issues that you have, all these various money things that are pulling at you, and, and put them into some context that will help to create a plan that will work. 
I don't mean to keep picking on Chris, but I know he and I had a conversation months ago about, you know, we both have children, and we're, I think we're both similar ages in terms of, well, how do you, how do you do it all? How do you save for retirement? How do you live your lifestyle, still save for college? How do you, how do you do all these things? And sometimes the answer isn't always, well, it, it is possible. Sometimes you have to prioritize. In my work with clients, and it's basically from the CFP standards, we follow a six-step process, and for you, it's something that you can do easily on your own, I think. Uh, if, if you're doing it on your own, it's really a five-step process. But the first step would be, you know, if, you're, if you're working with a CFP, it's establishing the relationship. You know, what, what, if you go to a person, if you don't come to me, what do you want to see happen? You know, what is my role? What is your role? role? What is the engagement going to look like? But if you're, if you're trying to do some of these things on your own, you know, the first step is something we already went over. So for you, step one would be just gathering the data and setting the goals. You know, where are you today? And, and like I said, keep it keep it easy. Don't start, unless you're maybe an engineer maybe, but don't go into some detailed custom spreadsheet. There are lots of tools that will quickly in the next hour give you some of this information. You know, gather the data, set the goals. Where are you today and where do you want to be? And then the second step is just analyze the situation. And so once you know where you are, you can you know, compare it to something else. Get a sense of, you know, where do you want to go? You know, is where you are uh, appropriate, or are there some trouble spots, so to speak? You know, do you have uh, credit card debt that you want to pay off, uh, or the student loans that are that are bugging you? I mean, everyone probably knows what their their financial issue is, and, and, and try to set some goal for, for improving it. You know, the next step will be just developing the plan and making recommendations. So, for example, let's say you decided that you want to pay down your credit cards. You're not sure how long it'll take, but that's something that's been weighing on you and you want to buy a house in three years, or whatever the story is. You know, by using some of these free tools, you can find out, okay, I've got this much in credit card debt, I'm making, but more importantly, out of my monthly budget, out of my cash flow, I'm spending this amount of money every month on credit card interest. And you're also gonna be able to tell, okay, but oh, by the way, I'm also spending, you know, whatever, 10% more than average on entertainment, or eating out, or clothing, or whatever it might be. You can pretty easily start to spot things with you know some subtle changes that if, if I said, okay, if I keep making my payments and I reduce you know my spending on X, entertainment, whatever it is, and recommit that savings over your credit card debt, I'll be debt free in two years or whatever the number is. And then you can use these tools, you know, virtual wallet, mint.com, whatever it is, or even just reminders on your own calendar to systematically start making payments to that end. And like I said, with, with the service I use, I get an email every week that shows me you know, what happened that week and every month, you know, where am I with my goals, whether it's for retirement, paying down debt, what have you. And the last two goals are, are or the last two steps, excuse me, are pretty important. The, the fourth one will be implement. You know, so once you've decided, you know, hey, I want to pay this credit card debt off, you actually have to start doing it. And again, keep it simple, automate it. You know, it's, it's for, for most people in the room, you're part-time freelancer, so it may be a little easier. You know you have certain incomes coming in that you can just set it so that you know, every... 15th of the month, an extra payment goes out. Uh, if you're if you're a full-time freelancer, it's going to be a little more difficult because typically your income is a little more irregular. Uh, but implement that plan. And then the most important step is going to be to monitor. For me, it's it's once a year. You know, maybe every not New Year's Day, but every you know, first of the year. Maybe it's your birthday. Maybe it's Christmas. Pick some anniversary date throughout the year that you want to. Set as kind of a guideline. Okay, every July I'm going to sit down and check out the big picture. You know, do what you just did, but update it. In preparing for this uh, for PodCamp, I talked to a friend of mine who's a freelance journalist. She's been doing it for about 12 years, and I, I wanted to kind of pick her brain and see, you know, what is it that that she does that she thinks makes her successful, or from among her friends. You know, that she sees them doing that makes them successful. And we came up with, with several areas to, to address. And again, these are kind of, you know, under that same guise of keeping it simple. If, if you can do some of these things, you know, it seems to be, you know, to make, you know, make people more successful. You know, the first, first one was, and it's, to me it sounded a little bit funny, but the, the idea was to treat it as a business. You know, it's, it's very easy. I liken it to, we work with some physician, physician clients. They're highly educated. They're very talented at what they do. They're very busy. But they generally don't know a lot about managing their money, and they don't have time to deal with it. You know, and some of the freelance folks that I know uh, are very similar. They're extremely talented at what they do, and they tend to dive right into the, the project or something that they really enjoy, as opposed to thinking it through strategically throughout the year 
you know, what do I need this business to produce for me? You know, I, I like it back to Justice Post as well, where he said, you know, he's got several areas that he works on, but he tends to kind of drift into that area that he really enjoys the most. It's not necessarily the one that pays him the most or is, you know, the, the best rate per hour, but it's what he enjoys doing. So it's, it's a lot about doing that. But I thought we could talk some more about that, uh, some more about cash flow, uh, taxes, you know, ways to analyze your business, uh, debt issues, and, and some investment issues as well. Because because when you're you know when you're working as a freelancer, this tends to be the issue, especially when you're full time. Is you know, is October going to bring the golden goose? Are you going to get that big check that you've, you've invoiced, or is it going to be a goose egg? And if so, what do you do about it? So cash flow, and again, a lot of folks here are, are kind of part time, but I think this will apply as well. The, the biggest struggle in, in what the post is about, what with the issue with a lot of Americans where you can't raise a couple thousand dollars in thirty days is, is just managing cash flow. And like I said earlier, it's exacerbated as a freelancer because you don't have unpaid yesterday, unpaid in two weeks, whereas you send an invoice, maybe they pay in 30 days, maybe they're slow, maybe they don't pay at all. You know, so how do you manage some of those details? What I found was there's a couple of ways to at least start to get on top of your cash flow. And the first is if your income, well, it's irregular, but it's not real irregular, where you know that if you, if you bill, you're going to get some money back in 30 days, 60 days, something like that. Take a look at what you already have invoiced. You know, what are projects that you're about to complete, projects that you've already invoiced, you know, for the foreseeable future, things that you're pretty comfortable with. And if there's if there's others that are a little farther out or, or you're not quite positive they're gonna come in, just ballpark. You know, discount them maybe 80%, 50%, something like that will actually come through. Take a look at that and add that number up. And then go through and add up, you know, what are your fixed costs, what I call the non-negotiables. You know, what are things that you have to pay every single month every single month. Mortgage rent, uh, utilities, food, anything that, that you typically have to do in a given month that you can't go without. And then pretty simply just divide those two numbers. And that's going to tell you how long your cash flow that's coming in is going to last. You know, ideally you're going to want three to six months worth of, of projects that are out there that are going to be paying off. Uh, you know, if, if that number is two, you know, you know that you're going to have to have more work by November or you're going to run dry. It's a pretty simple exercise to give you that, that guideline. Now, if, you're, if your income is really inconsistent and you tend to work on bigger projects that pay off in bigger chunks, uh, it may not be the best use of your time to do that because you may find for the next two months you have nothing coming in. So sometimes it's, it's better to just kind of go backwards and look at the last six months, the last year or two, and get a sense of what you typically average if your clientele is, is, is consistent, just to give yourself an idea of what you can predict throughout the year. And once you've gone backwards and kind of averaged out that income, you can do that same exercise. The other thing that, that, you know, getting into kind of managing it as a business, when you think about some of the issues that are just taken care of for most of us, that we have traditional traditional roles is, you know, how do you set your prices? You know, how do you decide, you know, where you are in the market in terms of what do you need to charge? And this is the biggest point. Um, let me jump ahead a couple slides here. When you do that, for a lot of us, it's, 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 you're not really used to doing it. You know, I have an employer that does the business plan. They do the budgeting. I'm involved in that process. But when you're out on your own, you're everything. You know, you're the sales guy. You're the HR person. You're, you're, you're everything. So just like you did for your, for your personal finances, it's a good idea to do that same role um, as essentially the business owner and look at you know, how do you treat it like a business. And the, the first step is just like with your personal situation, is to sit down at least once a year, if not more frequently, and map it out. You know, what is it that you need to produce for you or for your family throughout the year, and, you know, for the, the big number, your annual number, and then back down into where you are every month. And so if you look at it, you can add up all your fixed costs, all the things that you want to do. And again, some of these online tools will do it for you, where they'll show you what you spent the last year or so. You'll have a sense of what you need to produce and at the end of the day, there, it's, it's generic, but there are only so many hours in the day, only so many hours in the year, only so many weeks that you can work. So when you figure out what it is that you need to produce to, to live your lifestyle and so forth, what I would suggest doing is dividing that number by about 1,100. You know, there's obviously more working hours in the year, but you got to factor in you know, taking a week or two off. You know, you're not necessarily billable all the time. You know, for the most part, I would say 
for most people, it seems that I found maybe 20% of the time, you just can't build. You're either marketing for new business, uh, you're working on projects that for one reason or another just take more legwork that you're not actually getting paid the full hourly rate for. But if you divide that number by 1,100, that gives you kind of a ballpark of what you're going to need to charge every hour. And you can kind of back down from, okay, I need to produce $50,000 this year, or $25,000, whatever the number is, and you can back into what your hourly rate has to be. And by doing that, you, you truly started to create, or just, excuse me, think about it as a business. And for some of us, you know, even me, I didn't go to business school. I don't have a, a, a great background in all of these steps. Again, there's some free resources that, that will work for you. And you know, when you think about you know, the SBA, some online tools where you can go and read up about how to create a business plan. You know, what are some things that you need to have in there that, that will help you? Uh, common forms that a lot of the business owners need to have. Uh, those types of things. And it, it, for the most part, explains it in pretty plain language. It's fairly easy to understand. But beyond that, most major cities will seem to have uh, offices, but more importantly, they'll have events. You know, where you can go, it'll be workshops on doing those types of things where you can get free help uh, to help know what you're doing as far as that goes. But the same thing that you did for, for your personal finances, you can do here as well. Beyond this, you can use that same six-step six process to figure out you know, where are you and where do you want to be. The one thing that, that I, in my opinion, that freelancers have you know, a big advantage is when it comes to some of the extra things that you can do from a tax perspective. I mean, there's some negative things. When you freelance, you, know, you, you also, especially when you're full time, you get hit both ends. You know, from a social security standpoint, you pay, you know, all of us pay, if you work for a company, you pay your social security share, but the company pays that same rate. But when you freelance, you pay them both. And once you add in Medicare, you're paying 15% out the gate just for those programs alone. You got federal taxes, state taxes, business licenses, things like that. Pretty quickly, you're probably spending about, on average, 30%, it's probably a good ballpark, just for taxes. But it's not all bad news. There's lots of things that I alluded to that you can do that, that most of us just can't. You know, you can do a lot of deductions that, that I cannot do. Um, you know, when you're filing your taxes, some of that money you pay for Social Security, you can deduct. Obvious things like mileage, uh, if you came, you know, pod camp from, from out of town, or if you go to a conference that, you know, you are gaining something for your industry, for, for your business, a lot of that trip can be, quote, written off, which all that means is that you can take it against your income and you're paying less tax on that one. And there's lots more things, too. There's technology you can, you can deduct. You can do magazine subscriptions. Pretty much anything that, that you're using to better your business. Or to, to gain knowledge or you use your business, you can you can write off there as well marketing expenses as well. But the big thing you have to worry about here is is it's fine to, to be able to write it off, but you have to track it throughout the entire year. Um, like for me, you know, my company will pay for part of my trip here, so I'm going to save the receipts from from dinner last night or from the parking garage today. Now the odds of me getting back the wheeling on Monday with all those receipts. Is for some reason, it's, it's impossible. Even if it's in my pocket, it just disappears. <laughs> so what I've got in the habit of doing is just trying to keep it simple. Um, does anybody here use a service called Evernote? Okay. What Evernote is, it's basically just an online document repository, if you will, where you, know, you can store notes, pictures, what have you, and you can tag all those documents with you know, categories and, and tags, just like you would that a blog. So what I'll do is I'll take a picture of the receipt you know, when I get it and just snip it right into Evernote. And you just tag it as tax receipts. And automatically, if you're doing it from your cell phone, it's going to geotag it so you remember where you were. It's going to have a date, a time, all that information right there. And you can add the note to it that says, you know, coffee with my accountant or whatever the, the brief note it was or pod camp parking, whatever it might be. And at the end of the year, you have month by month lined up all in that tag. It's going to be very easy for either you to, to, to write off or to give to a bookkeeper or an accountant or something like that. Yeah. But they, they accept the picture from Evernote as. An I try to still put it in an envelope, okay. so I still have it. Okay, um, I mean, for an audit, yeah, you're probably going to need something okay. tangible. And just so you know, I'm not a CPA. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's it's as far as that goes. Yeah, it's it's more for the bookkeeping aspect. And okay, keep track of it. Yeah. And then worst case, you can always, I suppose, go back and try to get receipts yeah. if you get audited and things like that. If you had to. Yeah.
Probably the, one of the bigger questions that I get in, in uh, sessions like these is going to be on, on debt. You know, it's it's a lot of what I've talked about, you know, can be used to help figure out what you should do whether if, if your goal is managing debt. Here's a couple of things that, that I like to, to, to kind of live by when it comes to debt that I see. I see a lot of people doing the opposite, actually. I want to just talk about why. You know, to me, I like to categorize debt in just two ways. You know, what you consider good debt and what you call bad debt. Yeah, so good debt is anything you're borrowing on for an appreciating asset, something that's going to gain value. So in theory, a house could fit into that bill, or the way that may not be the case. I consider your student loans, your education, to fit that bill, uh, because without them, you need to think about where you, what you'd be earning versus what you'd earn today with, with a college degree. You think about bad debt in terms of depreciating assets. And pretty much anything you put on a credit card, for the most part, is going to be either an experience, a meal, or some product that's going to go down in value pretty quickly. On top of that, the interest rates are generally pretty high if you're carrying a balance, and there's really no benefit from a tax standpoint. And that's the other thing about good debt is typically there is some sort of tax incentive to, to carrying it. Car loans can be a gray area. Uh, obviously, the, the asset depreciates, but it's anymore you can get them for fairly cheap and for, for a kind of a moderate uh, time frame. But my rule typically is to, when you have debt, if a goal of yours is to, to, to pay it off or to pay it down, typically you have to decide, well, unless you only have one debt, what do you what do you attack first? And in my view, what you're going to want, want to hit is the highest cost, bad debt first. So I don't care if you only have an $800 credit card that's charging you 18% interest and you have a $100,000 mortgage, you know, I want you to hit that credit card first. Now there's lots of people out there that would say, the opposite. You take your smallest loan first. The theory is that you know if you have five loans and you have a thousand dollar credit card, you're going to get more satisfaction and an emotional appeal out of paying down that small debt quickly. And so you went from five debts to four debts. You're going to get some sort of you know feeling of accomplishment. And if that's something that you think would help you, I think that's fine. But from a pure dollars and cents standpoint, you're just spending more money on interest than is necessary. So I like to start with the highest cost bad debt first. And, and work through your bad debt first. So credit cards, you know, then maybe move into car loans, things like that. Would you say that student loans should always be last, though? It depends. Um, if you think about, do you know the interest rate? Um, I don't need to know it necessarily. Yeah, but no, I, don't, I mean, I can find it. I yeah. haven't been there, so. I, I would look it up and see what it is. Because, for example, typically, I would do one of the two things. What the interest rate is compared to your other debts. How long are you paying on it? Because I mean, student loans you can pay off in five or ten years. Sometimes you can extend them to almost like a mortgage over thirty years. So, how long are you paying on it? And then, you know, what else do you have? You know, so. And also, if you're in a situation where you can deduct that interest on your taxes, you know, if you itemize and can do that, then it's probably best to, to if you have other debt, to pay it, it off first. Um, but I've seen, you know, a friend of mine went to law school, and you know, they push their debt over 30 years, and it's, I want to say about 7%. I mean, there's no, I can't give you a line of saying here's the number, but generally in today's environment, 2011, if you're paying less than 5% for something, which you know today is probably your house, if you could have refinanced it, you know, a lot of cars, if they're, if they're new, would be under that. Student loans anymore, if they're variable, they might be under that as well. Um, so I, I would categorize, I wouldn't say it's necessarily the last thing you pay. I, I, I would say if you have a mortgage and you're paying, if it's, if it's a fixed rate, you're paying less than five. I mean, today the rate's less than four, actually, if you can qualify. But if it's under five, I would make that your last. If that's your question, I would make that your last thing you pay off. I found that something helpful with doing the approach of smallest debt first mm -hmm. was then once that's out of there, out of the way, then snowball it into the next smallest yeah. debt and the next smallest and so on and so forth. And doing it that way, I was able to get out of all of my student loans in seven years. Correct. Yeah. So I think what you're saying is, so, so look, for example, if you're, if you're, if, if you're paying, already budgeted to be able yeah. to live on whatever you're paying uh -huh. off, then so if you pay off something that was costing two hundred dollars a month, and your other debts cost you three hundred, well now that next debt you start paying five hundred dollars a month. Right. You keep rolling that into it. Oh, that's that's another thing too. Absolutely. So so kind of along those lines, I'm I'm generally opposed to prepaying cheap good debt. Um, and again, this is kind of predicated on having, you know, a credit score that, that you can get some of these rates. 
you know, so if you have a mortgage that's costing eight percent, that's good debt, but it's pretty expensive. So take out the grain of salt. But if you have a mortgage today that's four or five percent, and you can deduct that interest on your taxes, your actual cost of that loan is much less than what you're actually paying. Because if you think about it, let's say you're you're sending five percent to the bank, but you deduct a portion of that off of your taxes, maybe your actual rate is three something. So in my view, unless you think for the next 30 years, so for example, let's say you were to put an extra 250 a month on your mortgage, versus what could that 250 do over here in some sort of investment account or savings account or what have you, unless you think that for the next life of the loan, 30 years, 25 years, whatever it is, that you're not going to earn more than that 3%, then don't, don't prepay early. Okay. I have similar views about insurance or protection in terms of you know what what you should do and what you shouldn't. And I'm a big fan of insuring what's what's expensive to replace and not insuring what isn't. So things that are obvious like your home, your life, you know, your vehicle is kind of mandatory. But I'm not a big fan. I see a lot of people that will buy you know extended warranties on a you know seven dollar seven hundred dollar computer, all of these types of things that you see all the time, especially with uh, you know in the freelance industry where you're you're it. You're the IT guy. You're the HR guy. You're everything. You know, you may want to spend an extra $200 to know that you're going to have support when well, the reality of it is, if it breaks in three years, you're probably just going to replace it anyway. Um, and then lastly, just kind of to give you some, some, some kind of tips on, you know, building your assets. And I've kind of done these, I try to do these in order in terms of, you know, what I would suggest a lot of people prioritize on. Um, you know, but when you're in a position, whether it's you know, through your, your day job that you're saving for retirement, um, just to kind of give you some general guidelines, if you're in your 20s or early 30s, the number that you want to be building towards, if we're talking about retirement, that you save you know, every, every, every year, every paycheck, what have you, is about 15%. On average, depending on what you're making now, it's, it's kind of hard to look that far down the road, but if you're thinking about you know, what is it going to take to get you to some point where you're either not working or you give up your day job and you're able to freelance or do something you enjoy in your 50s, for example, that's the number that, that traditionally, if you do it through, say, like a 401k plan or something like that, will get you to the point that you're going to be able to move past that job and replace most of your income. Not all of it. Uh, but the assumption I'm making is that you know, you'll have a house that's paid off and some of those other things. And, and real quick, um, you know, not many people here are full-time freelancers, but another area that you have a big advantage over, even me, is your choice for retirement plans. You know, I work for a firm that has a 401k plan in place. Now, that's what we do for a living, so in theory it should be a good plan, but if it isn't, I don't have any other choices. If that's the plan that the firm offers, take it or leave it, so to speak. You know, as a, as a freelance employee, you can do anything that you want from what I have all the way down to doing something on your own. So depending on how much money you want to put away every year, and if you want to put away a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars, there are individual options that make a lot of sense. There are traditional IRAs, Roth IRAs that work great. You put the money in, you know, it compounds gross, either tax free or tax deferred, depending on your situation. But you're not required as the employer to, to make any contributions. That's kind of on the, on the smaller end. The, the bigger end you can get, you can do things like simple IRAs that are very inexpensive that give you a little bit more room to contribute. Uh, SEP IRAs, 401ks. The big difference is, there's lots of differences, but the big difference is to keep in mind is how much money you can put away. But also, if you should ever take on more employees, what you may or may not be required to do. You know, so if, if you, you know, start a, a anything but a traditional account for yourself or a Roth account for yourself, if you then hire employees, you may be required to offer to them and do some of those things. And we, I can take questions around if, if anyone has one um, as we go. Last thing I want to touch on real quick is, is you know, what appropriate finding competent advisors. And, and some of the imagery I have here, you know, at the top is what I call the alphabet soup of initials. You know, I, I talked earlier about the CFP. I gave you a general description of what that is. Probably didn't mean a whole lot to you. But if there are today, somewhere in the 80 to 85 range of different designations that people in my industry hold themselves out to be. And they're all certified something, and they're all three. You know, certified retirement council, or certified elder care, or all of these various things. What you want to look for is, what does it stand for, but really what does it mean? What did the person have to do to get those credentials? You know, was it, you know, a couple years of study, a two-day exam? 
Was it something they got on the weekend? Is it something they went through some continuing education and, and got just by default? And on that note, beyond that, what do you have to do to keep it? And you know, once you have it, do you have it for good, or do you have to continually test and, and keep up with your licensure? Are there any what I would call fiduciary duties that go with it? So if you think about an attorney or an account, they're legally obligated to put your interest first. Most of these designations are not. And so you want to look at some of those things as well. I'm talking about my industry, but it's the same thing with, with uh, law and, and CPAs as well. And by doing that, you're going to give yourself a chance to avoid, you know, for those of you who don't know, uh, Bernie Madoff, um, <laughs> just put it out there in case someone doesn't know. Um, you know, probably one of the bigger, biggest scams in our country's history. But I also like, you know, hiring competent professionals when either it's something that you either can't do yourself or your hourly rate is such that if you try to do it yourself, you're going to end up costing yourself more money. So things like contracts, if you're dealing with a, a bigger client that wants you to sign some sort of contract, it's, it's worth several hundred dollars to have an attorney look it over and suggest things that you may not catch yourself. Um, if you have a family, if you have children, yes, you can go online and do some of these things, like you know, get your, your, your will and last testament online, but depending on your situation and what you want to see happen to your family, if you should die, sometimes it's worth hiring an attorney to get sure, make sure those documents are, are done correctly. Real quick, I mean, I've, I've talked about a lot of different things, and I, I mentioned when we started that there, there aren't a lot of great resources. What I've got, I've pulled together 10 different uh, websites and blogs that I think are useful. And if, I think in about 10 minutes, it's gonna auto-tweet from my account uh, what it is, but if, if you want to receive that, it's basically just an RSS subscription page that I can get to you. It's just a folder that if you click the link, it'll subscribe through your, your reader. Uh, just 10 sites, uh, selfishly one of them's fine. <laughs> but it'll, it'll give you some ideas as, as to what, what to do. And for me, it's nice that you just put in there once a week, you check it, you check the headlines, scan up or abuse, you read it, if not, you just place the whole folder and start over. Uh, but if that's something you're actually just, just see me afterwards. Um, now we've, we've kind of covered a lot of fire hose information. Um, there's about maybe five, six minutes left. If anyone has questions, I'd be happy to, to get more specific about your situation. Yes? How do you know when transition from being a freelancer to forming an LLC? Um, is that something that you, may, that may not be in your it's, 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 it's not, but what I would suggest is, I mean, are you in Pittsburgh? I am. Do you, do you work with a CPA? Um, yeah. Sort of? Yeah. What's I mean, I, I honestly <laughs> think that that's an area that you're going to want to talk to either a CPA or an attorney about. Okay. Um, because obviously it has to do with liability. Right. You know, because you're out there, you know, the, the question is, you know, should you stay on your own as, as a freelance employee or should you form an LLC? What that means is, you know, if you're out there just as a sole proprietor, you know, your livelihood is technically at risk because anything you do is you. Even if it's just you but you form this LLC where you now have, you know, basically this company that is at risk. So anything you put in the company is at risk and your personal assets are generally shielded. To me, it's going to be a, a question of volume, a question of, of, your, of your business. Um, you know, I had a question before from a friend who, who does you know, crash on the side. If they wanted to, to, to do that, you know, full time, there's probably less risk there than if you're a freelancer that's giving advice and creating some sort of other part of the clip. Right, the but I mean, I, I would suggest that if, if you're if you're questioning it, you're probably pretty close. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I, you mentioned uh, places online that can help you manage your money and receipts. How secure are they? The ones that I've, well, I don't want to give a blanket statement that they're all secure, but the ones that, I, that I've used, it's like anything else. You know, the biggest security risk is yourself in terms of you, know, you logging on down here and not clearing it out. Um, generally speaking, they're very secure, but they're not foolproof. Yeah. You mentioned the percentage. My accountant said to save 35% of your income and make sure you can cover taxes. Yeah, I would say. For 25 and I'm 35. Well, so if you're on your own, you're going to pay 15% out of the gate okay. just for Social Security and Medicare. Mm -hmm. um, in West Virginia, that's the state tax rate is 6% a month. That's from where PA, what it is. But I mean, so right there, you're 20, 2022. The lowest federal tax rate is 10 to 15. Mm -hmm. And there's some deductions. So I would say. 30 at least. 25 seems. Yeah, he said 25 I mean, if you're just doing something on the side where you're going to have deductions that pretty much, even if you make money on paper, you lose money, 
that kind of thing. Like if you have rental property, where you're wanting everything to the rental property, for example, or if you have a business where you have a lot of deductions, then maybe you don't need to save as much. But in my opinion, probably their opinion, it's better to have a little extra for six months in an account that if you don't end up needing it, you can use. Yeah, so I would say, yeah, 30 is a good rule of thumb for that. And on top of that, another 10 to 20, depending on your age, for longer term goals. Okay. All right, I'll be here for a few minutes if you have any other questions. Thanks, guys. Thank you.